Well, um, I had an interesting time yesterday watching some stuff from trying to get uh, uh, more of a position from the left. I uh, started out because I, I saw Jimmy Dore was on, so I decided to uh, watch his stream. And it was very interesting because he had on this guy Nick Brana from the uh, the Movement for a People's Party is what he calls his group. I guess it's not called the People's Party. So this is not some th new third party or something. Uh, that's going to try and compete in elections. I guess they're a group who's trying to pressure for there to be some kind of alternative to the Democrats. Uh, I don't know necessarily if that means that they've ruled out the Green Party or something like that, or um, who knows, maybe they even um, would be uh, in favor of taking over the Democratic Party. But either way, uh, this is a, an anti-establishment left group that apparently um, last week Ha, uh, went around to uh, of the homes of a bunch of Democratic and I think even some Republican politicians, members of Congress, to uh, post a, a list of demands on their door, kind of like, I guess, Martin Luther. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if they're related uh, to these, um, to some of these uh, violent groups that we've seen at the homes of local politicians on the West Coast, like the mayor of um, Oakland, I think it was, her house was vandalized, and of course the certain city council members in Seattle who were not necessarily on board with defunding the police. But from what I'm hearing, it doesn't sound like this group is, is necessarily tied to that, but this sort of tactic um, maybe is starting to spread, this tactic of going to people's homes. And so on the show they were discussing how uh, they had some big, some big surge planned for today. Um, that on July the 25th, because I guess all the, the provisions from the CARES Act, which I discussed earlier in the week, are set to expire, I guess today is going to be when the final $600 checks are going to be mailed out, um, and it doesn't look like that those will be continuing on uh, in the same form in the future. Um, it would seem as though, like I discussed earlier in the week, that either, you know, as of yet, there's been nothing passed to replace the $600 a week checks uh, from the federal government, but if there is something passed, it seems like it's going to be a lot less. You know, Republicans were talking about uh, cutting that all the way down to $100 a week, um, but now it looks like they're they're at some, somewhere a bit higher than that. We don't know yet. That's still a very fluid situation. Well, this group um, appears to be trying to pressure the Democrats, I guess, to get more um, out of the Republican Senate and, of course, I guess, out of the Democratic House itself, um, trying to get more out of the Democratic leadership. And I, you know, I find this interesting because, you know, I, as they discussed on the show, there there hasn't been any news coverage of this for the most part, and I haven't seen any. But you know, they were talking about this a lot, but they didn't show any pictures. Of course, that's not really how Jimmy Dore's show works. Um, he normally doesn't, you know, have up a a, a, a B roll feed or something like that. But I've been looking online through their social media and stuff. Um, and I didn't see any huge crowds today with everything they've going on. I figured today, um, you know, would be the big, uh, you know, the big push since that's what they were talking about yesterday. And even looking back earlier in the week, I haven't seen anything, uh, again, that, that seemed like any particularly big groups um, like they were talking about. So perhaps this group is, is more of a paper tiger and there's a reason why. Um, you know, they haven't been getting much attention. Now, something that I was, um, that I've been discussing is sort of the, uh, when it comes to this whole, this whole event uh, in Portland, not to get off topic, but this is, this is related, this is the ongoing unrest in America, was the, uh, the ability of uh, what started out as a small, relatively small group of Antifa folks to assimilate um, large numbers of, you know, uh, hashtag resistance types uh, you know, I guess you could call them kind of boomer leftists, although not all of them are boomers, but it's that sort of thing. It's, it's the equivalent uh, to, the, um, to the default MAGA people on the right who just, you know, hey, everything Trump says is good. This is the everything Trump says is bad side of that. And they latched on to what's been going on in Portland and joined in, um, even if they themselves are not necessarily like Marxists or something like that. And so I've been trying to look to see if there's any uh, viability to this to this group because I was interested in, in their actions because you know what he was talking about um, visiting the homes of 30 politicians that sounded kind of important to me it sounded like you know that's a lot of coordination that takes um, and 
you know, you could, so depending on how many people showed up, um, that could be a, a very big deal. But, you know, what I've been able to gather, it doesn't seem like they're getting very many people. The pictures they're putting up only have a handful of people in them. It's not like they're, you know, pictures of big crowds or anything outside of Steny Hoyer's house or something like that. And that doesn't mean necessarily that uh, that this group is, you know, is bad or poorly organized or something like that. What it means is that they have not been able to assimilate the resistance types into their network. And perhaps part of the reason for that is, is that these are the type of leftists who are, you know, openly um, opposed to the resistance types and make fun of them and, you know, call them stupid. And I'm not, I don't mean to say that they are trying to be mean to those people. But they've clearly defined themselves as something other than that. Whereas the Antifa folks in Portland um, didn't do such a, a you know, such a, uh, a strong job of that. Um, you know, they were waving signs that said Black Lives Matter, and the resistance folks said, "Hey, I think Black Lives Matter, and I think Trump is bad. So I guess I'm on these people's side." And that, you know, maybe that is really the weakness of this group. And, uh, you know, I, some of you might think, you know, why, if, the, if you don't think that this group is relevant, why are you focusing on them? And it's, it's not so much because um, I think that they themselves are, are super important or that I find them super interesting, even though it was a very interesting interview hearing their perspectives and things and, and what Jimmy had to say. But because I, I think this serves as a lesson to, um, you know, what really energizes people, because these are folks, you know, um, I told you that, that it, it basically is a movement to try and create some kind of third party to go up against to replace the Democrats on the left. Um, and those sorts of movements, I think, are not are inherently crippled um, and are going to be unable to attract a lot of uh, mass appeal because what energizes people, you know, is not political ideas. What energizes people are the teams themselves. It is the red and the blue. That's why people, ordinary normies, uh, the folks that you're now seeing, for the most part in Portland, uh, that's what is getting them up off the couch. It's the fact that they see, oh, Team Red is out there bullying our Team Blue guys, and so we got to go stand with Team Blue. Most Americans um, have to work a day job. They have uh, other concerns in their life other than politics, and so if they're going to get involved politically, uh, well, then they are going to have to have it simplified a bit for them. Um, they can't have these abstract ideas floating around in their head that they have to synthesize into some kind of coherent worldview. They have to, you know, they need somebody to help boil these things down into a simplified binary choice of good things and bad things. And, you know, they are going to pick what's good, um, you know, sort of based on uh, their cultural proclivities for the most part. People are going to stand with the group um, that they feel like, um, you know, is their group, whoever, wherever they feel like they fit in, that's where people are going to do it. And so if you want to build any kind of a mass movement, it has to be, in my opinion, within that, uh, that sort of that binary constraint. Because even though I think the core leaders, um, you know, uh, and, and ideologues behind uh, you know, what has been kicked off now in Portland and in all these other places and this movement for People's Party, even though they are very principled people in, in all likelihood um, who feel the same way whether a Democrat or a Republican is president, um, if they were doing all of this um, when with Obama in the White House, um, you wouldn't be able to get very many average Democrats up off of their couch because they would feel fine and they would think, well, you know, my guy's in charge, so why would I be upset at the federal government? Obama's a good person. He wouldn't do anything bad. Um, if he's sending uh, DHS or the U.S. Marshals into Portland, well, then it must be for the right reasons. It's specifically the partisanship um, that is making, uh, that, or that allows um, sort of all of this, um, all of these sparks that you're seeing in Portland um, that allows them to sort of spark a fire. Because remember, we had some unrest um, over the uh, over Black Lives Matter and stuff like that when Obama was president, and guess what? It didn't really go anywhere. Um, it flared up a couple times, Ferguson and Baltimore, and then it went away because people thought, you know, hey, uh, we have a black president, and the black president will take care of it. Uh, you know, congratulations, everyone. We've ended racism. But now uh, that uh, you know you have Trump in in the White House. 
um, Democrats can confidently say that, you know, we have a very racist country, not just a racist culture, because they still believe that when, when their guy was in office. They could say, well, we still have Republicans in this country, so there's still a lot of racists. The South still exists. We haven't completely sawed everything um, south of uh, Washington, D.C. off and pushed it into the Atlantic Ocean. So we do still have racism in this country. But they thought, well, at least the federal government isn't racist. At least the federal government is run by good, kind-hearted people who have everyone's best interests at heart. And now the only reason why they are comfortable rebelling against the federal government, the only reason why they don't feel like that that's some, uh, you know, like that's neo-confederatism or something like that, something ridiculous, um, is because um, they look at... Uh, our political situation and they say we live in a fascist dictatorship and the only way to escape uh, this this death spiral into a uh, fascist dictatorship is to vote blue no matter who I know that sounds cringy and unrealistic but I think that that is the popular position here um, yes there are Marxist ideologues who really believe in real ideas um, and who will not vote blue no matter who in November, but they do not represent the masses. Um, they might be um, spearheading the efforts of the masses. They might be trying to use the masses um, to, to achieve their own ends, uh, but the masses themselves are still um, incredibly uh, crippled by this binary thinking. Now, before I go, I want to mention that uh, somebody sent me a video in the comments yesterday uh, that was sort of by a, uh, um, a leftist trying to uh, um, give, in his view, what the you know what the true um, uh, series of events regarding Chaz and that whole event was, and how he, you know in his view the media has um, distorted all of that and made. Uh, the, uh, the the situation there looked like it was much worse than it actually was and that it was just a bunch of peaceful protesters who were being attacked by the cops and then defending themselves and that uh, the police were the aggressors and whatnot. And that basically the claims of wrongdoing, of, of extortion of the local citizens, of um, the violence uh, that was uh, said to have occurred in the Chaz while it existed, that this was all just propaganda that was hyped up and that there was no um, evidence provided uh, that uh, any of the folks in Chaz did anything wrong. And they said that the reason why there were people running around with guns is because they were afraid that the Proud Boys were coming and that that was some kind of disinformation that was spread by the police. And, you know, my response to that video is, other than the, you know, the whole solid factual stuff that was in there, which everyone agrees on, um, I, there's nothing really that I could gather from it because it was, you know, it was kind of hearsay stuff. Um, uh, which way you're going to lean on, on, you know, what's true is really going to be based on whatever your personal biases are. Because, you know, if you're going to take a side on any of these um, issues that they brought up at all. For example, the violence that occurred in chat, you can say, oh, well, there was the police have, you know, no hard evidence of this stuff that they said occurred. And it's like, well, hey, well um, you know, on the other hand, you can say, well, the police couldn't get into Chaz, so they couldn't gather any evidence. And the evidence was all tampered and destroyed. And so we don't know about, you know, whatever crimes were committed. And so in the end, it's it's he said, she said, and there's really nothing I have to say on that. So with all that out of the way, uh, if you get anything of value out of this video, I'd appreciate you clicking that like button and sharing this video. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe because I do upload every day and I'd hate to have you miss one. So I'll see you folks back here tomorrow.